Hey, what's up? My name's Luke. Today I'm going to be tier ranking every psychedelic book so you know which ones to read. Let's get right into it. The first one we're going to be doing is How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan. You may recognize it from the Netflix series documentary that was done about it, following him through different chapters of his book. Um, this is a great book. Um, this is a great book for beginners. It walks through a number of different psychedelic medicines that he experiences himself, which is how you have to experience psychedelics. You can't just read about it. It is truly a weird experience. So he's a very good uh, person to be a public advocate speaking about it. He comes from the food space um, and knows, I believe he did some research into caffeine. So um, interesting guy, um, interesting book, good for beginners. He doesn't necessarily add any new information himself, um, but what he does add is um, updated science. So neuroscience, the cutting edge of neuroscience, and um, it's up to date. So what we're going to do for this one, number one is going to be cool. Next is going to be the Psychedelic Explorer's Guide by James Fadiman. Now, James Fadiman is an OG scientist in the space. He was doing research into psychedelics before it was made illegal in the 1960s. And this book is both a guide for beginners, very, very good book for beginners if you want to learn about how to actually go about your first journey, depending on whatever the medicine that you want to do. For example, a question, you know, okay, you've taken your medicine, it's now been an hour, but you don't feel anything at all. What should you do? Do you take more medicine? Do you not take any more? Do you wait till the next day? How much more do you take if you do? Do decide to take more. Well, that's answered in this book. And the actual answer, by the way, is your booster dose um, is should be at most 50% of the initial dose. You don't want to take more than, um, than that. Just to be safe, you can always wait to another day. Uh, he also dives into some research which kind of felt out of place in the book. Some parts sort of dragged on and on because he actually never got to publish his studies into the research on creativity and psychedelics. And I guess he took the time in this book to do that. So um, very good book. I'm putting this in the A section when it comes to psychedelic books. He also outlines microdosing as a phenomenon, and this book is credited with popularizing it in the early 2010s, if you remember, about Silicon Valley and LSD microdosing. They would take a dose called a tenor, 10 micrograms, micrograms, which was laid out in that book. So next we've got The Cosmic Serpent by James Narby. Now, I really loved this book. Uh, sorry, Jeremy Narby. Um, what it does in the core of it is He's an anthropologist, and he goes to South America, to the ayahuasqueros who drink ayahuasca as their shamanic practice, and he takes them seriously. He decides he's going to listen to them and take them at their word for what they say. Because, you know, when you hear someone say, yeah, so, you know, you go to a foreign culture and, or you know, shamanic culture, and they say, oh, yeah, I flew to the beyond, and I met the ancestors and asked them why this person was sick, and they told me he needed the milk thistle two glasses of milk thistle and I came back and, and then you there as a Western anthropologist, you're like, okay, but what do you actually mean by that? What do you mean by the beyond? Well, Jeremy decided to take them seriously. He's like, no, they literally mean what they say, that the spirits of the plants like tobacco and they do in fact like tobacco. Now, where it gets kind of a little bit weird and weird in a good way, but also weird in a not very convincing way, is he sees a parallel between the images and mythology of snakes and some of the um, uh, Mexican, Central, and South American uh, myths and um, the visions that you'll have under ayahuasca and DNA itself. And uh, it talks about the theory of panspermia, that the idea that life came to Earth um, in the form of DNA or something and uh, on like a meteor or something. It just isn't that convincing through to the end um, because the domain of mythology and the domain of science are very different domains and you ask different kinds of questions. And that parallel is very interesting and there's something about it, but it doesn't, I'm left sort of unfulfilled from that question. So very interesting book. It's going to be a C. Moving on to the next one. This one is going to be controversial. PCAL, which is an acronym, um, which means phenylethylamines, no, phenylamines, phenyl, phenethylamines, I can't remember the name, I have known and loved, P-I-H-K-A-L, a chemical love story by Alexander Shulgin and Anne Shulgin, rest in peace, Anne passed away recently, um, I'm incredibly grateful for these authors and this book in particular, because what they did was um, crazy um, and amazing, I'd say, but definitely crazy first, is they synthesized hundreds 
of potentially psychedelic compounds and tried them on themselves. Definitely do not do this at home. Now the book is laid out by substance and they first explain how you make it and then they explain different, uh, they show different trip reports of them experiencing the different ones. Now some notable ones in there is MDA, which you may not be familiar with, but you may know it as MDMA, MDMA is very similar to MDMA, which became popularized um, and emerged in popular culture and rave culture in the 80s and moving on through to the therapeutic use, largely in part because of this book right here. And I'm incredibly indebted to MDMA. There's a video I have about how MDMA got me a girlfriend. Check that out. Um, and anyway, so this book is very interesting because the stories they have, it's like someone experiencing something you've known uh, very well for the first time. It's not a good book for beginners. If you're curious and more intermediate or advanced, it's cool to see like, oh, they tried PCP on themselves. Oh, they tried this other weird, you know, obscure research chemical that you may have heard of or experienced yourself um, and seeing how they went about it. They also try a lot of the um, impure uh, substances that often end up in LSD that isn't LSD and you kind of see the differences between them too. So for that reason, this is going to be a C. I love them. I love it. But the book itself, it's a C, I just got to say. Now, the next one is interesting. This is The Memoirs of Richard Nixon. Luke, why is this a psychedelic book? This guy started the war on drugs. This guy single-handedly led to incredible amount of suffering, incredible amount of lost opportunity for healing, incredible amount of pain for so many people. While the book apparently does outline very successful foreign policy initiatives that he made, um, the domestic policy in the US of starting the war on drugs was a massive, massive failure, loss of life. Um, and for that reasons, it's going in the F column. Sorry, bro. Okay, now we're doing very interesting book, Psyche Unbound. You may have not heard of this one. It's very recent. It's a compilation of essays in honor of the life of none other than the godfather of LSD himself, Stan Groff. Now, uh, Stan Groff is a historical figure in the psychedelic movement. He pioneered LSD therapy in the Eastern Bloc under the Soviets in the 50s and has facilitated over thousands of LSD sessions in that time. And uh, basically, he's a very powerful, influential person who's had very powerful influence in the psychedelic space. And this is a very, very good book if you're uh, well-versed in his ideas around uh, his extended cartography of the psyche. Um, this is a compilation of essays that are correlated, related to, build on, compare and contrast, or add to his ideas. You see um, none other than um, Joseph Campbell, Richard Tarnas, of course, one of the editors, um, uh, Rick Doblin writes a foreword, and I also have the book right here, which is great. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, some of the names in here are crazy. Uh, Christopher Bach, Bach, B-A-C-H-E is in there. Um, uh, some very big names in the psychedelic space and some people you'd want to check out on their own. Houston Smith is also in there. Ralph Metzer. Richard Tarnas. Anyway, so definitely check that out. That is a uh, cool book to look at, but it's more advanced. So for that reason, um, it also has a very beautiful cover, by the way. It's like, it's so nice to hold. It's like hardcover. It's beautiful. Um, in the honor of Stan Groff. Now, it's not a very educational book in the sense of like actually learning about safety and learning to navigate your journey. So for that reason, it is going in the C column, although it does have a special place in my heart be just from being um, Stan Groff. Also, I want to show I do have a copy of uh, The Cosmic Serpent right here. So next, we've got a classic, a very influential book. This is The Doors of Perception by Aldous Huxley. Now, you may know Aldous Huxley because he wrote the book Brave New World, which has the notorious substance Soma that is putting the people to sleep or something like that. Wow, the guy writing about substances, putting people to sleep and making them obedient and in this dystopian novel, you know, how wouldn't psychedelics be part of that? It's like brainwashing people. The opposite, The Doors of Perception is a semi-memoir um, uh, short book, about 70 pages long, actually. You could read it in an, in an evening about mescaline. Now, you may not have heard, heard of mescaline. It's not a super popular psychedelic these days. Um, if you heard of peyote or San Pedro in the Native American church in the U.S., the mescaline is the active ingredient of those cacti 
the psychoactive cacti. Um, I've had the privilege of um, having several uh, San Pedro uh, ceremonies myself uh, with a friend of mine who, who has some. And it's similar to LSD. It's a very long journey. Anyway, so this is Aldous Huxley's exploration into um, mescaline and the significance of mescaline, the impact of mescaline, the religious, the metaphysical, the social, the personal uh, meaning of it and what it means for perception. And uh, it's so short that usually includes the book Heaven and Hell or the essay of Heaven and Hell included with it. Sometimes you ex experience ecstatic journeys on psychedelics. Sometimes not so much. It can be very challenging. And what's up with that? So he explores that in this book. This is great um, if you're more advanced. It's not necessarily a beginner's uh, book. But if you want to explore psychedelics being taken very seriously, then this semi-philosophical book is for you. This is going into the B column here. Now the next one, which I have right here, is a very special book for me, or a book I am very excited to own, Cleansing the Doors of Perception by Houston Smith. Wait a second, didn't we just look at the book, The Doors of Perception? He calls this book Cleansing the Doors of Perception? What's up with that? They're friends. In fact, a lot of these authors, they quote each other, they cite each other, they have quotes from each other at the starts of their book. Cleansing the Doors of Perception starts out with quotes from none other than all this Huxley himself, the mescaline experiences without any question, the most extraordinary, et cetera, et cetera. That is an excerpt from The Doors of Perception itself. That was done intentionally. Also an excerpt from Albert Hoffman, who we'll see later. William James, who wrote um, the something uh, variety of religious experiences. Huge influence in the world of psychedelics. And he wrote that at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, here, he has chapters titled, including none other than empirical metaphysics. Empirical Metaphysics. Those two words are never together. Empiricism was a you know modern philosophy of the 17th century, and metaphysics isn't that that weird religious thing that is all about the non-physical. Then how can you be empirical about metaphysics? Well, psychedelics seem to be a tool to explore metaphysics empirically. So very cutting edge, very philosophical. You know, subtitled The Religious Significance of Entheogenic Plants and Chemicals. This is a great book for intermediate and more advanced use, although he does cover the basics of set, setting dosage and the reasons why those things matter for your psychedelic experience. If you want to know what you're getting into, this is an amazing book for a very deep dive into what it's talking about. Very well written. It's witty. It's funny. Houston Smith is an amazing author. Um, it uh, isn't dense in a way that isn't readable, but it will challenge you. So this is going in the A column, guys. This is such a good book. Um, to be honest, I've just skimmed it so far, but I'm really looking forward to finish reading it. So next we've got The Way of the Psychonaut by Stan Groff. This is a historical book for, it's a new book, uh, two parts, two volumes, The Way of the Psychonaut. Now, why is it so historical, Luke? The reason why is because Stan Groff has written tons of books in his career. There's almost too many of them. And it's hard to navigate which ones you want to read. Um, and But this one is a very good starting point for the uh, for his literature, as well as a very thorough encyclopedia around psychonautics, the exploration of your mind with psychedelics. Now, it's written like an encyclopedia. It's very explicit. Um, so it does, it's sort of segmented by topic, and it's not necessarily like a narrative, although there are reports and stories in there that are mind-blowing. This is a paradigm-breaking book. The only reason it's not an S because of the significance of the information that it conveys is because of the difficulty of reading it sometimes, because it is encyclopedic, you know what I mean? Now, some people say it's not really encyclopedia because there's stories and stuff. It's more just Stan Groff. Yes, and that is maybe the saving grace that there's like stories included and everything like that. So uh, very great book. It also dives into um, uh, holotropic breathwork and uh, how there are the mystical experience induced by psychedelics is not unique to psychedelics at all. It's a constituent capacity that we have, that every human being has the, every human being, he says, has the right to the potential for a mystical experience. Psychedelic medicines are one way of accessing those. And other modalities include breathwork. And holotropic breathwork is the one that him and his um, wife, uh, Br Bridget, Bridget? Uh, I forget how to pronounce her name. It's like weird pronunciation. Anyway, they develop holotropic breathwork. And with holotropic breathwork, you can induce a one-for-one -one equivalent psychedelic experience without taking any substance. Mind-blowing. I've tried it myself. Anyway, um, definitely 
explore that if you want. He also goes into the expanded cartography of the psyche. Biographical layer is where traditional uh, psychology mostly covers childhood trauma, adolescent trauma, stuff in your adulthood, patterns of behavior, um, cognitive behavioral therapy is all about the biographical layer. And then he goes two layers deeper. And if you want to check them out, you'll have to read the books or I'll just tell you right now. Oh, and I have them right here too. The Way of the Psychonaut, Volume 1 and 2. Amazing books. You can see how many uh, ear, uh, dog ear, whatever you call that in the book there are. So, uh, oh yeah, the expanded psyche is um, the biographical layer, the perinatal layer, peri meaning around, and natal being birth, and the transpersonal, meaning between people or above people. This is an A, a whopping book. Summarizes 50 years of therapy, of, uh, of uh, studies in consciousness therapy. Okay, next we've got a very, very controversial book. This is not going to be an easy read, people. Drug Use for Grownups by Carl Hart. This is a great book for people who want to deepen their understanding of the significance of psychedelics, but more broadly, how substances in general, drug use, um, can uh, be treated in a grown-up way. Um, Carl Hart is a board member of MAP, so he's very deep in the psychedelic space, and many people who advocate for psychedelics um, are practice something that Carl Hart calls out as psychedelic exceptionalism. And this was seen when Carl Hart put out this book saying that all drugs should not be criminalized. Drugs should be legalized. And that the causes of addiction are, are very much uh, social, that they're a very significant factor in the cause of addiction. If you're isolated, um, if you don't have community, if you don't have support, then that leads to um, uh, propensity for addiction, let's say, more than just the willpower and the substances itself. Um, context matters. Now, um, he advocates for the legalization of all drugs, and he's very open about his casual use of substances like heroin. And you, if that makes you uncomfortable, then this might be a good book for you to read. Um, I had the honor of meeting him at uh, Burning Man, actually, and uh, he's such a warm-hearted guy, very caring guy. Um, I sense his heart is, is he, he, he's a very heartfelt person. And when he put out this book, I believe in 2017, he said, he was destroyed in the media. He was shut down. This guy advocating for heroin, what the, what's going on? Um, and what he noticed was the psych people in the psychedelic community didn't come to support him or speak out for him. He attributed that to psychedelic exceptionalism. Um, so uh, yeah, very great book for an exploration of that. I haven't read it, uh, although I did take a look into it. Um, also, something to note, why is it that certain substances like um, say caffeine, alcohol, okay, maybe those aren't the best examples. Things like psychedelics are, are embraced um, and many people use cocaine, but when people are using crack or heroin or some of these other drugs, it seems way worse. Well, he sees uh, um, a connection there being that some of those are drugs that are popular in black communities in Canada and the US and elsewhere, um, while the drugs that don't have the same stigma are ones that are used often by lawyers, rich people, white people, etc. So what's up with that? He poses questions like that. So drug use for growing up, this is going to the B column. Next, we've got DMT, the spirit molecule, none other than Rick Strassman. This is a historic book. This is a weird one, and this is for more advanced people. If you're curious about DMT specifically, get this book, it's for you. Um, but this is the one that documents how uh, alien abduction experiences are a not uncommon experience under DMT. Now, how do you account for that? Well, that's the big question asked by this book. How to, um, what to, how to understand these experiences because DMT is such a weird substance. He also covers not just DMT, like the you know chemical, you know injected in your arm, like a doctor type way, but also in the form of ayahuasca. And um, now, one drawback from this book is he does um, sort of approach it with. A conclusion in mind is my understanding. I haven't read the whole book. I've kind of skimmed through it. Is that um, uh, the pineal gland? He says is attributed is the place where endogenous DMT is released inside of the brain, and that he suggests DMT <clears throat> is a very personal and human thing because of that, and, and emphasizes the pineal gland for that. You may have heard of people talking about decalcifying your pineal gland, and that tap water calcifies your pineal gland. I don't know if that's just a thing in LA or not. Um, 
but the science around that is contentious. So there is some question about some of his ideas there. That said, uh, it's a great book if you want to do a deep dive into DMT specifically. So uh, for that reason, DMT is going in the B column. Actually, you know what? Yeah, it's going to the B column. I was going to put somewhere else. Anyway, this next one is going to be interesting for you guys. The Red Book by Carl Jung. Luke, why are you talking about The Red Book by Carl Jung in a video about psychedelics? Well, I'm reading it right now, and it's actually incredibly valuable for me in exploring my journeys with psychedelics. The reason why is you need to understand that psychedelics 